Good morning, everyone. I know that you're just getting settled. We're going to give everyone about a minute. And while we wait, please enjoy this video from today's sponsor. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Before we get started, I want to share my gratitude to the presenting sponsor of today's program, Rio Tinto. A quick note in case you are new to the GoToWebinar platform, if you hover your mouse in the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll notice a small orange arrow. Clicking it opens up the GoToWebinar control panel, and you'll notice a drop down which will open up today's handout, the agenda, and a list of upcoming programs. And you can also ask questions. There's a pop-up box for the question box, and you'll be able to submit your questions to Michelle. If you have any technical issues, just email programs at executivesclub.org. Like all of you joining us, I've been anxiously awaiting today's conversation. Amid extraordinary challenges brought on by 2020, Michelle Ducaris and the brewing giant Anheuser-Busch found a way to utilize innovation, resilient partnerships to deliver effective business results. In addition to this program, we're really excited to host a virtual happy hour in beer tasting with Goose Island for our members right at 5.30. So I look, for, I look forward to giving you a virtual shares then. And here to say a few words and introduce our speakers is Parmitha Das, who's the general manager, marketing and development of Rio Tinto. Thank you all for being with us today. Over to you, Parmita. Good afternoon. I'm Parmita Das, General Manager, Global Marketing and Development at Rio Tinto. Really quickly, Rio Tinto is the world's second largest metal and mining company. Great to be here today, and I sincerely hope all of you and your families are safe and healthy. I'm thrilled to be here today as a presenting sponsor of the Executive Club of Chicago's program, especially because we have Michelle here with us virtually in Chicago from Anheuser-Busch in there. Almost a month and a half back, Rio Tinto and Anheuser-Busch announced our new global partnership to bring a more sustainable beer can to the world. Today's partnership, our partnership is probably a great example of the topic of today's discussion and AB's mission, Purpose Beyond Brewing. We at Rio Tinto are thrilled to be partnering with Anheuser-Busch to reach new feats and bring heightened awareness of and accountability to sustainable material in AB InBev's products. This partnership will see AB InBev use Rio Tinto's low carbon aluminum made with renewable hydropower, along with recycled content to produce a more sustainable beer can. This will offer a potential reduction in carbon emissions of more than 30% per can compared to similar cans produced today using traditional manufacturing techniques. And the partnership will also leverage outcomes from the development of our world's first disruptive zero carbon metal made via Elysis technology, a zero carbon metal that emits oxygen during the process to be used in AB scans. Today, we will hear from Anheuser-Busch CEO, Michel de Caris, about his and AB's journey through the challenges of 2020 and the way this market-leading brewing giant has leaned into innovation and the strength of their partnerships to continue to thrive and deliver strong business results in an otherwise difficult climate. Moderating the conversation today is Todd Asmu, president of Goose Island Brewing Company. 
I know we are all very anxious to get the conversation started. So I'd like to thank you all for being here today. And without further ado, I'm ready to talk. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Parmita. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Executives Club of Chicago. As was mentioned, my name is Todd Osman. I'm president of Goose Island. Uh, I have been with Goose Island for 13 years now in various roles, uh, leading the company for the past three years. Born and raised in Chicago, very proud of my Chicago roots, as is Goose Island. Uh, with our partnership with Anheuser-Busch, we are now a globally distributed company. Uh, and I've heard from many people where we are the representation of Chicago uh, for many people throughout the world. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of that. And, uh, you know, 2020 has been a, a challenging year for all, all of us. Uh, just real quick before we move on to the bigger picture of Anheuser-Busch at Goose Island, we've, we've really taken care of the community. A um, couple quick examples. We worked with some local distillers, Koval and Reinhall to help them make hand sanitizer. Uh, our brew pub has regularly been distributing meals to hospital workers throughout the throughout the uh, Chicagoland area. And uh, we've put together quite a few programs around hospitality workers themselves, uh, bringing awareness to, to some fundraising and kicking back some money. Uh, and also helping our, our partners who are in the hospitality business owning bars and restaurants and such. Um, so it's such a privilege to be with all of you because I consider you partners as well. Like I said, we're proud of our Chicago roots and it's in all our best interest for Chicago to maintain its economic vibrancy and its cultural diversity. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna pass it off and introduce Michelle Ducaris, Anheuser-Busch's CEO. Um, so Michelle has worked in the brewing industry for more than 20 years. In his roles at AB InBev, he's moved around the world, such as overseeing commercial operations in Latin America, developing Budweiser into the number one premium beer brand in China, and expanding the high-end business unit that encompasses the company's most premium brands to more than 20 global countries, including Goose Island as part of that. So Michelle assumed his current role leading the flagship North American business in 2018. And over the last three years, Anheuser-Busch has outperformed beverage industry competitors in key metrics like growth and volumes and earnings. Now in his role as CEO, Michelle is advancing his strategic vision for what it takes to lead the industry to inspire growth across the company, fostering a culture of innovation, and I can attest to that, and setting a course for long-term success. Uh, so as I mentioned, 2020 has been tough and an unpredictable year, particularly if you're in a business as we are that's tied so heavily to the travel and hospitality industries. So as we make our way through this new normal and eventually look toward recovery, there are a lot of questions about what the future may look like. That's what Michelle and I are planning to get to the bottom of during this conversation today. But before I get into it, Michelle, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Executives Club of Chicago. And thank you for offering to spend some time with us this afternoon to share your perspective I'm managing through the pandemic. Thank you, Todd. Thank you to the Executives Club of Chicago. And thank you all for, for being here with us and for having me here. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I wish, as all of you, that I could be in Chicago personally instead of being digitally. But these days, we are all getting used to Zooms and all the calls that we have and things that are moving digitally. I personally, I'm a much more a traveling and in-person type of uh, man. So I, I love every chance and opportunity that I have to be around and to get to meet and know new people and learn from them. Chicago especially is very close, dear uh, to everything that I have done in the last 20 years. So I love the city. I love Goose Island. I love the energy and the culture that you have around Chicago. I could experience that myself in the past when I was a student at the Kellogg Business School. Later, with my partners and friends from Goose Island, I usually go three, four times every year to Chicago. And now, because everything in life goes in circles, so my daughter is a freshman at Northwestern, the Medill School of Journalism. And she is going to pull me back to Chicago. So you're going to see me for sure in the next few years. And we are very happy always 
when we have the chance to be in Chicago or to be part of Chicago history, culture, and everything that exists there. So it's a pleasure. Well, we're, we're very happy to, to have your daughter uh, in Chicago uh, studying and look forward to when you come back to visit the brewery. Let's jump right into the state of the business. How's the beer industry doing? You know, a few weeks back, a report from Beer Business Daily raised the alarm that there's still a, a hard road ahead for the beer industry. And in particular, the on-premise side of the business, which we refer to as, the, as bars and restaurants. Uh, you know, at, at Goose Island, we're, we're very heavily invested in that. That's where we, we've made our relationships. We always sample our beers through the on-premise and, you know, Wrigley Field. I'm sure everyone's familiar to seeing our beer at Wrigley Field and Lollapalooza, the music, music festival. Um, Michelle, can you talk about how strategically managing both sides of the business for Anheuser-Busch uh, is right now? Yeah, Todd, maybe uh, one point for us to get started is that a lot of what we've been doing has to do with conversations such as the conversation that we are having here. Because since the environment is changing all the time, it's very fluid, there is a lot of volatility everywhere, learning from others and being close to people is being our number one priority and our number one source of advantage, if I would say as well. And in, in talking about the state of the industry, I think that I need to start by saying that this is a global crisis. This pandemic is a big healthy issue uh, uh, that spread around the globe and affected a lot of people. We all have in a way or in the other uh, people that we know that they were either in business or personally impacted by the pandemic. And of course, we are very fortunate to be in a situation that is still uh, is not as impacted as other people, either personally or professionally. So I just want to make sure that uh, I put my point out there that we, we continue to be uh, together with these people through the difficulties that they have, being our partners, our employees, or people that we know uh, personally. And when I think about the, the state of the industry, I think that uh, globally, everybody was in a way or in the other impacted by what happened. Some people could adapt quickly or pivot, and then they became part of the solution and they profit in a way during the crisis. And some other industries that they were more established, like ours, they suffered from the impacts of the virus everywhere. I think that uh, as a company and me personally, I was very fortunate to see what was happening in China. And for a lot of people, this is the first experience of lockdowns or the first experience of using masks or dealing with all these screens and things that happens when you have this virus. To me, it's not the first. I've had myself three times before when in Asia, I lived in Asia for seven years. I went through crises similar, not the same size of this one, but I could learn a lot from what the procedures and protocols are in Asia when you have such a, a complicated situation to deal with. And then beer globally started in Asia. The problem migrated to Europe, then later hit the Americas in the North, Central and South. And the last continent to be impacted was Africa and was pretty much like the same impact everywhere. So at the beginning, people were afraid of what was happening. Then there was the lockdown. Then there was like a little bit of recession, then government stimulus, then consumers changed and adapted. And so companies had to change and adapt as well. I think that when I put all together, uh, you think that our system and our system are, is the breweries, then you have the wholesalers, then we have the points of sales, was heavily impacted. The part of our industry that's suffering the most is the hospitality part of the industry. When you think about one year without sports and all the venues are closed, without music or theater, uh, restaurants operating at 40, 50% capacity, 
a lot of bars closed, a lot of the holidays, people not traveling. So that was the part of the industry that suffered and it is suffering the most. And you need to adjust and adapt until things go back to normal next year. On the beer side, we had a little bit of everything. We had like lockdowns in Mexico and Africa. We were very fortunate in the US because of the agriculture part of the business and the logistics part of our business being very important for maintaining the logistics operating system in the country and the supermarkets and groceries operating with the right uh, profitability and inflow. We are deemed as essential for the economic activity. And then we could balance a little bit what we call the off trade, more the supermarket part of the business, uh, vis a vis what was happening with the own trade that was really, really impacted. And we are partnering and try to help them all the time, not only to reopen on a safe way, but also to be able to navigate through the storm and have a chance to come back after this all goes back. And we are in the, in the sector by ourselves. We have like more than 30 restaurants and brew pubs in the United States. And we were there very close with our customers, consumers, but also with our people because they were impacted in a way as well by everything that was happening. But all in all, uh, I would say that we are in the, uh, in the good side of the crisis so far, and we've been working very hard to make sure that we deserve the status that we have. I think that you touch on hand sanitizer. I think that when everybody was crazy running after hand sanitizer, we changed it and we shifted a lot of our operations to produce hand sanitizer. We often produce water for disaster relief. Now we changed breweries and lines to produce hand sanitizer. It was more than 45 million ounces of hand sanitizer donated at the beginning of the crisis. And now with the elections, we partner with most of the states donating hand sanitizer for the pooling stations. Uh, we worked very close with American Red Cross because they knew and they taught us that during those crises, people stop blood donation and blood becomes one of the most scarce of all commodities. And we were able to partner with NBA, NFL, NHL, create these big center donations where people could go safe and have the safe distance and the safety uh, feeling so they could continue to donate blood and that worked very well in the US and Canada. And we also supported like bartenders, restaurant associations. We sponsored a whole campaign for the National Bartenders and Restaurant Association on their welcome back safe uh, to their own trade. And this has been helpful so far. So it's, it's been a good journey. Great, so before I move on, I wanna emphasize something you brought up. Uh, because I get asked the question all the time, we've been part of Anheuser-Busch since 2011, and people always ask us what's what's changed since then. And I think they expect the answer is going to be nothing, but uh, a lot has changed. You know, Anheuser-Busch has a people-first culture, and one of the examples of that is the uh, safety protocols that we have learned and implemented at the brewery, and that has really set us up, I think, to to be ready for the pandemic so to speak, but as you mentioned, uh, with we, we do brew some Goose Island beer in Wuhan, China. So we had some really good learnings and, and I think we're ahead of it. So very proud to be part of the organization, but and the way it was cascaded forward to the, to the North American part of the business and to Goose Island specifically. So that was great and it, it did apply to Goose Island. Uh, but let me, let me shift a little bit, Michelle. So we've mentioned this new normal uh, and how it applies to Anheuser-Busch. How have you seen the pandemic shift the demands uh, of our consumers? And has anything been surprising to you and what trends have emerged during the pandemic? Of course, a lot of things surprised us all, right? Is every day a new surprise? But I think that there is a couple of learnings that we are all having and maybe because we are making a lot of efforts in pack them up, I can share with you. I think that the, 
the first point that called our attention very early on and is being proven through the the several waves that we are seeing of this pandemic is that not necessarily a lot of things changed and new things were created but on the other hand what happened was a brutal acceleration of trends that were already here but they were not equally adopted across the globe or across the regions if you might say in the united states examples right so everybody was dating and using here and there uh, e-commerce as a way to buy goods, services, uh, even food, right? And if you go for places where the ecosystem is really well developed, like in China, this is no longer like an option in people's life, right? So in China, you don't use cash anymore. You don't use credit cards anymore. You don't order your goods anymore. Uh, by phone or you don't go anymore to buy things in a supermarket. Everything is pretty much like on your mobile phone and you buy your groceries while you are riding the subway and you book your restaurant when you are walking to a to a office meeting and then you pay your restaurant out of your mobile phone. With the pandemic, all these trends accelerated big time across the globe and now in the US or in Brazil or in Africa, everybody is buying everything through the phone. Everybody is being informed, digesting content or absorbing content and having financial transactions in a much, much faster way than before. And this broke a lot of ceilings that were there for companies that you, you saw exploding in the US. So an example is Zoom, the other one is DocSigns, and all these other uh, tech companies that exploded now. So that was a big thing. The second point that's a very interesting one, and I think that in the, in the North American part of the world is a very clear cycle, is this idea of home becoming the new hub. And we have some data. A lot of people have a lot of data, what they call that the, the house, cycles in the United States, which is a generation shift that happens every 20 years, where people swing like a pendulum between suburb and downtown areas in cities. And the last big cycle was like 25 years ago, where people populated the suburbans and there was a lot of construction and a lot of houses being built. Then through the last 20 years, People moved more into the, the cities and big cities. And it looks like now that there was this rediscovery of how nice it is to live in a big house, to have a, a big backyard, to have space for you, and to have possibilities to do more of things that you like to do close to home. And technology is going to be a big enabler of that because we all learned, not by choice, but we were forced to go and work from home. And we saw that worked perfectly, right? So here in the company, we have 85% of our employees that they are deemed as frontline people, that they are either in the breweries or in the sales department. And 15% of our people is what we call the back office overhead. And these people, we moved them to work from home in the first week of March, and they never came back. Like, uh, I'm in the office now, but we have only 20% of the people at the office at this moment because of safety protocols that we implemented. The remaining 80% of our people, they continue to work from home and is working perfect. So they have agenda, they have technology, they have everything that they need. We ship goods for them when they need to taste a new product. They can build mockups and ship to us back when they need to show us uh, virtual images. And I do believe that as we move forward, this idea of a work for every, from, from everywhere type of idea is going to be very possible. It's not that everybody's going to work from home. It's not that everybody will need to come back to the office. 
but I don't see people rushing on a Friday 7 p.m. to go to the airport when you are traveling for a holiday of three days that basically takes you one day to go, one day to come back, and then one day to stay there taking pictures and post on the Instagram, right? I think that people will take the chances and choices of traveling at noon or one day before, pay less on their tickets and work from the holiday destination when they are there. So whoever is gonna have a meeting at 2 p.m. and a school appointment at 4 p.m. will no longer have to choose choose between both, right? Uh, either I please my boss or I go there and I see how my kids are growing up and, and being educated. I think that people will be able to do both. So this thing of remote work and home as a new center a new hub, a new cafe, as people talk about this today, is going to be very true. The other thing, which is a, a trend that was out there and is becoming now very important, and we know because the early data in China, but I think that in the US, there is much more data and it's going to be explosive, is this idea of health and wellness related to much more than looking good. I think that the, the virus was not really damaging and attacking people equally. The virus was very selective in the battles that he could win. Uh, and I, I don't have all the knowledge on that. So doctors have and researchers, they have. But I think that this huge wave of health and wellness that was already present in everything that we do will multiply and gain momentum now to become a much bigger wave and a much bigger part of everybody's life. And people will be much more conscious of the choices that they make every day. So this can prepare them to have a better life, but they can ensure that they're gonna have a longer life. And another force that will help people to make these choices is gonna be the cost of health insurance and the health system overall that went up now during COVID, we need to be passing through an overhaul that's gonna be huge. So people will be prepared for the next wave that for sure is going to happen. And this will bring costs for everybody. And the only way for you to avoid the costs is gonna to be to be healthier. And people will lean towards healthier choices big time. So I think that the, the three big things was acceleration of things that were here, in terms of the biggest accelerations, digitalization for everything, then homes becoming a new uh, place for you to be with your family, friends, work, exercise, enjoy life. And then health and wellness will be huge because the post uh, pandemic will bring a lot of info for the surface that will make people consider either on the healthier part or on the cost part that they have no other choice than be healthier. Sure, so that, that's really interesting, you know, and I'll, I'll bring up some real examples for Goose Island. You talk about the acceleration of some macro trends like health and wellness, you know, even I would say a year ago, nobody would have expected craft breweries to come out with a low calorie beer and now, now it's expected. We have a low calorie IPA out, uh, you know, and people people aren't surprised by that. They're, they really are expecting it. And then you mentioned some shopping habit trends that we thought were maybe 10 years down the road, uh, like e-commerce at Goose Island during the pandemic, we have created a new department to address e-commerce. So we have our own e-commerce department. And then you mentioned a, a shift in occasions, which I think is really, really interesting. Uh, and I believe we'll see how this works, that we're going to ask everybody out there to participate in a poll. Um, which occasions have you found yourself celebrating during the pandemic? And how has this shifted? Um, you know, we, we've seen a, almost all of these accelerate, but let's let's see what, if you guys can click on that. I will tell you personally uh, that I have probably drank more beer at home in the last year than I have in my previous 20 years combined, uh, and I'm not complaining about it. I've been able to communicate with friends virtually and uh, really have delved into my cellar of uh, sought after beers. So let's give it a couple couple minutes here. 
Any, anything surprise you there, Michelle? Time spent outdoors, 40%. Um, I think that overall is not a surprise. If you then link more of our business, I think that meal times uh, is a, a huge occasion now because beer is much more like friendly to be at home than sophisticated beverages. And you can have a lot of sophistication in different occasions related to beer. And a lot of people, they've been adopting beer for meals at home as the go-to beverage because it has less calories than wine, less sugar than wine, is not that complicated as the hard liquor mixers that you have to do when you go to a bar and there is someone there doing for you. Just in terms of the trends as well, I think that I, I missed one that was important that we saw surfacing everywhere and here in the United States was huge, was this multiculture uh, effect of people getting together around things that unite them and maybe perhaps the the blacks life matter was the biggest of all uh, manifestations of that but that was much bigger in all other cohorts of the population as well so hispanics asians all of them getting together digitally around passion points things that they like and and they usually do and those things then reflecting back to the more uh, real environment outside of the digital environment, being restaurants, being food delivery, being the growth now that you see with specialized grocery departments to attend parts of the population that before they were more mainstream. Now there is this several different niches that people are are trying to take care of. But that, that was the fourth big force, the multicultural uh, relevance. Great, great. So we, we've touched on some of this already, but eight, eight months in, uh, being in a place where business operations have really begun to stabilize and even, even growing is uh, quite a big feat for Anheuser-Busch. I wanna talk about a little bit about what it took to get there because it's been a hard road for everyone. Uh, can you talk about AB's overall approach to managing the many twists and turns of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I will try to, to do this in a simple way. And then you tell me if we need to go deeper in any of the, the topics. But we very early on, as I said, like uh, end of February, we established our crisis committee and we have decided to focus the entire work in three work streams. We called the safety of our people. That's why you saw all these protocols, work from home, the hand sanitizer production, the PPE adoption that we had. The second one was what we called business continuity. And our business depends a lot on our suppliers in one hand, right? Because to produce beer, we need the cans, we need the bottles, we need the barley. And on the other end, our wholesalers and retailers. So we made everything that was possible to be deemed as essential so we could maintain business operation and the social economical impact that that would have was huge. So we have more than 2 million people being employed on the beer sector only in the United States and the economical impact that we have is huge. And I was very glad to see that we could maintain the entire supply chain working so these people could have their jobs, they could pay their bills, they could be supporting their communities. And the third one, we do this for more than 160 years, was to be part of the solution. And that's why we came, at, came up with American Red Cross, with the hand sanitizer and those things. And as we were doing this, then we adopted an idea of simplifying and unwind everything else that we were doing that was not absolutely key to maintain business continuity. So there was a huge simplification in all tasks and all other things that we were doing. Then as we successfully implemented this, and that was the first six months, we divided the crisis then in three phases as well. So three priorities, but then three phases. The phase one, which we called 
prepare and protect was related with these three priorities. And then we kept on training our people. So we stopped at all the breweries once a month to give people education about how to use the PPE, the PPEs that we had, how to make sure that we were safe. And we had a very, very low level of contamination across all breweries. And every time that we had a case coming from the community, we would isolate 40, 50 people to make sure that there was no spread inside our brews. That was prepare and protect. The second one was then the preparation for the reopening. And we called this reopening and reignite. And that was making sure that we could support, especially the own trade accounts, our restaurants, bars, that they would rely on us to go there and help them to restart their business. And that is still in place because we're still working on the reopening. And our number one priority there was safety in the reopening being extended from our own facilities to the facilities of our partners, being the wholesalers or the points of sales. And then the last phase was what we call rethinking and reimagining the future. Because a lot of people, they live under this impression that after the crisis and after COVID, things will go back to normal. And I always tell people that is a, a bad part of my job to disappoint them, but I need to tell them, and it's, it's better when I say earlier, that there is no such a thing as go back to normal. So that normal that we used to live in 2019, 2018, will no longer exist and things will go back to a new normal, but the new normal will no longer be as we used to know. So the best thing that we can do in this reimagination of the future and rethinking how we work and how we get uh, adapted and adapt our own operations and behaviors for the future is making sure that we embrace the changes that are happening, either societal change, or consumer change, or technology change, or behavior change, and then we embrace them and we move forward. So we are pushing very hard inside the company and together with our partners that people do not sit on their hands and wait for the back uh, view of what was normal to come back and that they adapt quickly, they innovate, and they think what we need to do so we emerge stronger as the new normal becomes the normal of our lives. And it's just embrace and move forward. There is no such a thing as go back to, to the normal there. So prepare, protect, reopen, reignite, rethink, and reimagine the future. And then in this phase, it's very important for all of us to ask the questions that will help us to reshape the strategy that we will need for the future. And the questions will be around what has changed with consumers? What are the new behaviors that they are adopting? How can I leverage the technology changes that exist now so we can reorganize the company and move towards a more uh, modern and contemporary company. Uh, what did I learn during the process in terms of efficiencies and productivity? So how much of what I simplified now, I don't really need for the future so I can live without? And how could we uh, launch innovations, for example, in 45 days now, when before it took us three years and we have done all of that working from home? So all those things, are the questions that we need to ask ourselves and make sure that we pack, wrap it up during COVID while all of this is still warm. So when everything goes uh, towards the future, we can reuse that then in a more uh, conventional type of environment and situation, which is gonna be probably April, May, June next year when we will see everything going back to normal, but the new normal, not the old normal. Well, that's a that's a great segue then. So, 
you know, consumer preferences and market dynamics are always evolving and, and changing. And Anheuser-Busch is known as a market leader in innovation, always has been. Uh, can you, could you give us some specific examples, uh, what products, what packages are you're excited about uh, that, that are leading that change in innovation? And, and before you, you answer that, just let me remind everyone that we're about halfway through the, the presentation here. Uh, feel free to submit some questions. We'll leave a little time at the end for a, for a Q&A. So if you haven't yet, uh, submit your questions now and we'll try to get to them at the end. But again, um, do you have any examples of, of some beers or beverages that you're excited about that are, that are leading this innovation? Yeah, in terms of beverages specifically, but a lot of things that are happening in beverages, they will also impact other categories. So I think that uh, when we talk about consumers and what they are doing, uh, that is useful for everybody that is, it has a business that touches consumers at the end of the day. I think that the, the big trends that we see uh, and they were strong or accelerated during the pandemic, they were number one, health and wellness related, right? And health and wellness related is not only things that are, which drug will protect me from COVID? Or what do I use today as a medicinal uh, drug that can make me live longer? So the idea of health and wellness is very holistic and is everything that we say is healthish or is less bad. And in this sense, you see, for example, calories going down and everybody's super concerned about calories. Carbs going down and everybody super concerned with carbs. Sugar going down. Alcohol levels going down as well to this so-called mid-strength type of alcoholic beverage. So not 12, not 15, not 20, but something that can be between 3.5 and 5%. So everything that's healthish has been growing and we will accelerate as we move forward. The second thing is because people, they were touched by this sense of urgency of indulging and enjoying life. So a lot of what we call premiumization. So people really try to treat themselves with things that are special. And sometimes it's very hard for you to treat yourself with a Ferrari that's super special, but costs you half a million dollars. But it's very easy for you to indulge on a beer that is special and costs you 10 bucks like a Bourbon County or on a chocolate that is specially made and costs you five bucks, or on a meal that you can go for a very special place or order at home, or have, if you, if you guys like barbecuing as much as I like, you note that was impossible to buy Wagyu steak with less than 20 days to deliver over the summer, right? Because everybody was barbecuing a lot, cooking a lot at home, and that is just, that demand that you can serve with A4, A3 type of uh, steak in the country. And if you would like to buy these very expensive steaks to barbecue at home, it would take you 15, 20 days to receive, right? So before the crisis, you could receive this in two, three days. Uh, so everything that's premium is growing a lot. And the third point that is also massive is what we call purpose-driven brands and products. So people much more conscious about the environmental impacts of everything that we do, from the goods that you use and reuse, from the products that you buy and the origin, the source, and the environmental impact that you have at the end of this. And all these trends, they can come together in a product or they can come separate in service and differentiated products. So one of the most successful products that we have in the last few years, you know this one, is Michelob Ultra Organic, right? It's a low-calorie, low-carb beer. 
is very premium look and feel. And as we produce and sell, we are helping the entire uh, community of farmers to increase their footprint of organic production. And organic production is very different from non-organic production. So every contract that we are cutting now is a five-year contract. We are subsidizing the growth for the farmers. We are making sure that as they do barley in the organic farm, then they can do other uh, grains and other things that are organic as well. And this is a big movement that feeds in itself, right? Because for every uh, square feet that we can help them there, they are producing another 10, and then they are selling another 10 to other companies. And you just saw the announcement done by Rio Tinto and us on the carbon footprint for aluminum cans. So massive as well. And a lot of the young consumers, they are placing a lot of bets behind companies that are more social and environmental responsible. And you see a big movement from boards, from companies, from investors to have very stretched goals towards environmental uh, and sustainability as we move forward. So these trends are big. Other than that, as I said before, there is this big, big trend of the different cohorts of the population, being Hispanics, Asians, uh, African Americans, and, and uh, the remaining parts of the population, white people, old people, young people. So there is no longer this idea that you can serve everybody with only one mainstream proposition. So you need to have differentiation. Yeah, in, interesting and um, touching on a couple there, other macro trends, premiumization, which Goose Island is very happy to hear. Uh, we've been part of premiumizing the beer industry for 32 years now. And then purpose-driven brands. I think, uh, you know, as it relates to us, our community involvement and really caring about the city of Chicago uh, is where we weave our stories in, in and out of that. Uh, but let, let's... Let's throw up another poll and talk about some of the uh, innovations that are out there. Uh, curious, you know, what industry innovations are you most excited about? If everybody could select again, hard seltzer options. We've seen that increase all over the place. Uh, introduction of canned cocktails like Cutwater, which is part of Anheuser-Busch. I know I've had quite a few Cutwater uh, co canned cocktails in my backyard this summer. And uh, as we're doing now, virtual events and the rise of e-commerce. Uh, let's see what what everybody picks here. I think uh, I think on the last one I had a good idea. This one I, I don't know. Oh, look at that. Okay, e-commerce, yeah. So yeah, for for me, I've I've been uh, you know part partaking in in food delivery for quite some time. In fact, when you know we tell tell our kids dinner is ready, quite embarrassingly, they run to the front door and and look for the. Uh, the delivery truck um but you know that that's that's really really accelerated I, i've heard you uh in some other talks talk about some e-commerce trends that we've learned uh from some studies and from the rest of the world and, and you kind of touched on it earlier could could we go a, a little bit deeper on on the specifics of how e-commerce has adapted to our industry um and you know how how is that how has that changed the environment how is that playing out in such a heavily regulated industry such as ours is? Yeah, I think we can talk about this in two ways, right? One is beyond e-commerce, the idea of having a more digitalized world is, is, is a something that, that there is no way back, right? And for those that have had the chance to leave in a more digital environment, it is very hard to adapt back, right? And I can speak about that myself because uh, when I was in Asia, we used to use a lot of digital uh, tools for your day-to-day. -day. So things that I can share with you, it might sound strange, but it's like I had to adapt back to use a credit card because I was living for three, four years without a credit card. Uh, I had to relearn 
how to fill a check, which for almost 10 years, I thought that was extinguished and no longer part of the, the way that you move money and you pay bills and you, and you do things uh, related to your banking and finance activities. So I was used to order food, not ready to eat food only, but like if you want to cook over the weekend, you could order your fish and two hours later get lobsters or fish delivered to your home alive, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So those things are very developed. And as we get now into the 5G uh, type of life in the US, after COVID and all the acceleration of these digital companies and all the money that was created and it is invested and will be invested, this will become much more a part of our day to day. And the thresholds in which this explodes, which is beyond 3.5, 4% of penetration for a given category, they are all passed by now. So there is no way back for food delivery. There is no way back for groceries deliver, groceries pick up, financial services, electronic documents, uh, virtual meetings, so on and so forth. And in our industry, because of the three-tier system, and I'm not sure how much people are familiar with the idea of three-tier systems, but uh, in some industries in the United States and in other countries globally, you have this idea that someone needs to produce, someone does the distribution, and someone does the commercialization, right? And we live on this three-tier system for alcohol in the United States. And this makes the e-commerce a little bit more difficult. I think that legislation will take longer to adapt for e-commerce for alcohol. But we've been seeing some breakthroughs that are happening. And when I think about the, the hospitality industry, restaurants and bars, they need to be the beneficiary of this e-commerce uh, option for the future because this will become a big portion of their revenues and they will lose a lot of money if they do only food they don't do the beverages and the industry will not evolve as much as it can if the legislation does not catch up so it's very important that the, the legislators start to catch up with the society and the societal norms and the technology that's available there so everybody can benefit from the investments that have been done in this space. And, and I think that we will all adapt. And when you talk about your kids and my kids and the younger people, so then they are native, they don't think differently. We need to adapt and we will adapt much faster than people believe in because it's, it's very convenient. And convenience is a force that is unstoppable. Is a trend that's yeah. unstoppable, and it is a force that's unstoppable. Absolutely. So we have five minutes left here. Um, my last question was going to be, what What are you excited about in the future for Anheuser Busch? Looking forward, but I'm looking at some of the uh, the questions I'm getting. I want to have time for the audience to ask some questions. I think uh, you could answer that question within some of these. So. Uh, here's here's one. I am a big fan of Bud Seltzer, one of the better brands. Any other products like this coming out? Michelob Ultra Seltzer is going to come to the market in January. It's going to be organic. It's going to be zero carbs and only 80 calories. And the taste is unbelievable because we work it in the technology and in the product for two years to bring to market. There is no uh, comparable technology out there. And it's going to be the best in class in calories, taste, and carbs. Uh, and it's 100% organic. So it's a great product and it's coming in January. Okay. And I, th I think this one may be a little more marketing related or distribution related, but 
I'd like Michelle to expand on his outlook on, on the hospitality industry given so much infrastructure is built in urban environments and not necessarily convenient for work at home populations. Also the impact on sports facilities. Yeah. Th that's a very difficult question. I will give you much more like uh, an opinion, but take this as an informed opinion and not by any means uh, a prediction or something that's meant to be right, okay? It's just an opinion with some data and information that I have. So talking about sports, I think that sports will come back and everything that's related to music, sports, conventions uh, is suffering a lot now. It will suffer until summer next year, but it will come back because it's a matter of the vaccine and the therapeutics to be in place and then people will go back to their behavior and they will back to enjoy a lot of the things that they used to enjoy before that's how i see and because a lot of the infrastructure is built and the infrastructure doesn't have a shelf life that's short right so the stadiums will be there the franchises will be there and the fans will be there when you think about restaurants, bars, cafes, I think that here we're going to have a big shift. I think that I have seen before in, in, in other places and I think that there will be like 30 to 40 percent of what we knew before will disappear and a new wave, different, more modern, more specific, uh, will be rebuilt. And that's going to be a huge turnover. It's going to be very painful because 30 to 40% of restaurants that we used to go, they will no longer be open. Bars that we used to drink a beer and eat sandwich, they will not be able to go through the whole crisis and stand there a year later after closing. But there will be a lot of excitement because new infrastructure will be built. And then perhaps in complementing the question, what I believe that's going to happen is more of the losses will be concentrated in the big urban areas and more of the gain will be come available on the suburban areas where a lot of people migrated to and moved to. But even in cities like uh, New York, for example, there is a very, so New York, Chicago, just so I calm everybody down, New York and Chicago, they will be always New York and Chicago. So there is no a new normal, a new world where New York and Chicago do not exist, right? So there is other smaller cities uh, that do not have the same cultural relevance, the same vibrance, economical impact that they will become smaller. But New York and Chicago will be always big cities and people will be always there and there will be this natural uh, gravity pulling people into these cities. But you get cities like New York, for example, uh, and everybody have had the chance probably to come here one day and go for a restaurant. So you not only eat your food and drink your beverage, you get a very good amount of information of everybody's life that is in the restaurant, right? Because you are sitting over other people while they talk about their home issues, job issues, company issues, you can't uh, uh, stand without listening what everybody's talking because the space is very expensive and very limited. Mm -hmm. So with this idea of the outdoor becoming part of the restaurants now in New York, the average is that the space in the restaurants is doubling in some areas of the city is tripling. So now you have double the space that you had at the same overhead cost that you used to have before. And so whoever survives through the crisis and whoever is coming back after the crisis will come back with a much better business than the one that they used to have before. And consumers, I believe, will have a much more enjoyable experience than what they used to have before. 
And I think that now the city needs to embrace this change, needs to make the outdoor space official, needs to allow people to build nice outdoor spaces, and then everybody is going to have a better outcome coming out of that. But the, the hospitality sector is the one that suffered the most, that will need more support as we move forward. 30 to 40% will not make the cut. They will come back in a different fashion or form, and they most likely will gravitate a little bit more towards the suburban, a little bit more towards the outdoor, but they will not disappear. They will just reinvent themselves. Great. Well, we are out of time. Michelle, I want to thank you personally. Uh, always very well-informed, forward-thinking vision. Um, a pleasure for me to be able to interview you here uh, in front of everybody. I'm sure everybody feels the same way. Thank you to the Executives Club of Chicago. A quick reminder uh, for everybody that signed up, really looking forward to the beer tasting tonight. We'll be walking through three wildly different beers, a Wheat Ale 312, a Hazy IPA, new on the scene, Many of you are probably not familiar. And then our Bourbon County Stout, which is the one that traditionally people camp out and line up to buy. Um, so it should be exciting. Uh, thank you, everybody. Michelle, I'll let you send it off while I get a head start on everybody. No, thank you, Todd, for the conversation. Thank you very much, you all, for having me here. It's a pleasure. As I said before, I have a very deep connection with Chicago. Uh, I love the city, I love the people, and it looks like that my family will have these connections with Chicago and the Midwest forever. It was my daughter's choice to go to Chicago, it was not mine. She decided to go to Medill School, uh, and I think that she's going to enjoy and have the same love that I have for Chicago. Uh, since you touch on Bourbon County, Todd, I would like to ask what someone needs to do to get some Bourbon County because we are right at the season and I need to get mine. So who should I bribe? What should I do? Who do I call to get some Bourbon County? I think after this call, if you go to the shipping department, you may find a nice surprise waiting for you. <laughs> but you know the yeah. right person. And what about people in Chicago? If they want to buy, what they need to do? Because we cannot have the lines this year, right? So what are you doing there? Yeah, I know we're a little over on time, so I'll go quickly. But our retail partners have been great. We gave them safety recommendations. Binnie's, for example, Jewel are doing a lottery system. And I think, um, you know, they, they, the, the response has been overwhelming. It blew them away. Um, so we adopted even on how, how people line up on Black Friday to buy Bourbon County Stout. So looking forward to sharing, sharing that with you soon. Okay. So thank you all. Margaret, thanks so much for the invitation. Pleasure to be with you and looking forward to see you in person one day. Thank you. So long. Thank you.